All right, beautiful. Is my audio and everything fine for you? It sounds very clear to me. Yeah. How about how about mine? Is yeah. Wonderful. Your camera's a bit shaky, or I guess I guess you're using your cell phone or something. Yeah. Oh yeah. Maybe you can set it up on a tripod or something. Then that that'll leave your hands free. No. No, you you don't have anything. Eh? <laughs> okay. No problem. Okay. Well. Uh, uh, Maybe I'll just introduce things a little bit here. I, uh, I, uh, Steve, you came to my attention uh, recently on Reddit. Uh, I was just, I think maybe for the first time, I was browsing through the uh, Debate a Vegan um, subreddit and uh, uh, saw your post where where you were where you were expressing your view, which I'll I'll let you express in a moment. But um, you explained. Um, to the subreddit that you were at one point a vegan, but your views have changed on that. Um, I guess you share with vegans, with with you know what are called ethical vegans, people who are vegan for ethical reasons as opposed to merely dietary. Um, you share with ethical vegans a concern for uh, suffering, you know, animal suffering, or suffering in general including animal suffering. And uh, you came to the conclusion that if the, if the aim is to minimize suffering, then veganism is not, you know, a necessarily, uh, a necessary um, diet, dietary implications. So um, yeah, we can, we'll, I'm sure we'll definitely talk about that. Um, maybe that was because of the context in which I met you online uh, that's part of the premise for us uh, chatting today. I'm, I'm definitely very curious to hear your view. I mean, I'm I'm open in principle, um, partly because we have that basic common ground. I called it the common ground of ahimsa. You know, do, doing no harm or doing as little harm as possible. I think that's what maybe is driving both of us. And uh, definitely curious to hear some of your um, reasoning for your position. I also um, when 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 I. Uh, you know, I looked at your uh, YouTube channel or the YouTube channel you're associated with. Um, I did watch your video on the the big red button scenario, um, which um, I was hoping we could talk about today too. I think it's 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 something I've thought about a little bit, maybe not as much as you have, but um, something I think we'll all be thinking about uh, increasingly in the coming years and decades. Um, so it's it's a fresh problem. I, I confess sometimes I get a little uh, tired talking about veganism just because it's, I mean, I've been vegan for um, decades now, a little bit off and on, but basically. And um, and one reason I thought it'd be interesting to talk to you is you've got a, you've got a take on veganism, which is rare out there, you know? Um, I mean, the typical um, criticisms of vegans, veganism one, one encounters come from people who haven't been vegan and have never been particularly sympathetic to veganism. So yours comes from an interesting place. So I thought it'd be worth talking about. Um, but yeah, certainly connected to that, I'd love to, um, maybe you could explain for the audience, you know, what this big red button scenario is, and we could chat about that a little bit too. Uh, cause I think that'll really help people understand just how radical, um, your, your position is. So um, I don't know where you want to start. We could, I mean, I think whichever place we start from, we'll get to the other place. So we could start uh, with the big red button. You could explain to us what that what that's all about and what your response to the red button is. Or we could start start right away talking about your history with veganism. Um, I'll let you uh, take it from here, Steve. Okay. So so basically, I'm an extinctionist, right? So. Um, I believe that humans should consciously cause extinction of all conscious living beings, that is sentient living beings, who can feel suffering, right? So, as I said, if, if I talk about red button out of the blue, it might sound radical, you know, especially living in 21st century, we might wonder why do we need such a radical solution, right? But if you look at it, uh, 
this world the 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 basic design of this world survival of the fittest and uh, you know uh, basically if you see um a lion has to hunt a zebra right so in this scenario if the zebra escapes then the lion starves and dies if the lion manages to hunt the zebra then the zebra suffers and dies so this is the basic reality design of reality nature of existence that we live in right so every sentient being born into this world will suffer inevitably right so and the other thing is that this suffering is very intense especially for 99.9% of the sentient beings because 99.9% of the sentient beings are animals right so they either suffer in let's say um uh, at the hands of humans right farms slaughter houses etc etc or in nature right so these animals unlike us they they don't have anything they they have to suffer so they they can't defend themselves from diseases they cannot uh, you know get out of predation right so if you want you can choose to be a herbivore but a lion cannot right mm-hmm. and you basically cannot blame a lion for it for being a carnivore right and uh, you know you can't blame the zebra for trying to escape right so basically we have a sadistic existence which forces organisms to suffer right so the other thing is that um atheism is something that is increasing a lot in society right so these believe that god has a grand plan and uh, you know uh, life is meaningful blah 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 but in 21st century um uh, we can't really believe in god right so yeah we, we can discuss about it if you are a theist but basically i don't believe in magic right so everything is uh, a set of physical laws and nothing cannot exist beyond those mm-hmm. so and even if you believe in a god you just take a child who is you know uh, stuck in a pedophile's basement who is raped every day who doesn't have the chance to escape why do you think a god is not helping that child Mm-hmm. right so what what harm did children animals ever do to deserve getting raped getting ripped apart alive right these these are innocent beings we are talking about right so so what i'm trying to say is that there is no grand plan there is no pur- purpose or there is no point in all of this suffering right so if you do get a red button right if you if you press is uh, press it the whole universe will disappear you have to ethically press it right so if you don't press it it means that because of your privilege because maybe your life is good or maybe you are enjoying some privileges you are aiming to continue the suffering of the intense suffering that these beings are going through mm-hmm. right so i would say it is an ethical obligation to press this red button mm-hmm. right since this existence is sadistic and pointless what do you, what do you do basically with a pointless uh, negative experience you eradicate it right yeah 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 oh thanks yeah that was pretty clear uh i guess uh based on 
just the way you concluded there, I, I, the thought that's in my head right now is whether it's fair to characterize existence um, as sadistic. Um, now, that might have been slightly colorful language you're using. I, I mean, if you're a non-theist, then of course, in some sense, in some strict sense, uh, existence isn't sadistic, which implies something higher than life is taking pleasure in uh, torturing life. It's, yeah. it's, it, 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 but... Uh, you can take it as a figure of speech. Right. I, gotcha. I, I don't gotcha. I, I don't believe in a conscious see, even atheists sometimes believe in uh, you know nature as if it was a conscious entity, but I don't. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, so it's a figure of speech. But uh, yes, so instead of, of it's, it is right. basically it's cruel, it's bad. Gotcha. So the, then the then the question is is more strictly just the question of what the uh sort of we could say net value of existence is on earth as we know it. Um, um, and your judgment is that it's radically negative, right? Radically in the negative. And I guess there's, I mean, that's an empirical question. Maybe it's the most important <laughs> empirical question we could uh, ever contemplate. You know, what's the, what's the net value of, of life? I mean, among all sentient... Uh, Creatures and... This is where I think uh, most people go wrong. We try to estimate the net value of life, right? So, so we think, okay, life is whether it is net positive mm -hmm. or net negative, right? So, um, the thing is that life can never be net positive. It's as simple as that. I, I I'll explain you with uh, two examples. So you can list out any anything, any pos positive thing in this world, right? So we have got a we have got a lot. Like uh, if you just pick a random person on the road, if you ask him what is what are the positive things in your life, he would list a lot of things. He might list uh, tasty food. He might list uh, you know dating. He might list uh, music, video games, whatever. But the real question is, can you even compare the positives of this world to the negatives? Right? So can you say that, see, see, uh, I am someone who enjoys anime, who enjoys video games a lot, right? This, this is like, we are talking the peak of my pleasure, right? Can I use the existence of video games to justify torture? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Positives, uh, can, I, can I really use the positives? Can, can I really? So, so these people, they try to subtract the positives and the negatives. Can, can I really do that? Like, how can these things, these things we call as positive, how, how can tasty food justify starvation? Right? Yeah. How, how can, and, and not to mention these net positives as we call it, they are actually not actually positives. We are actually alleviating the suffering. Hmm. Right? For example, you, you might like a food, a dish. Let's say you like falafels. Right? So, if you, if you even if it's the most favorite food of yours, if you are full, if your stomach is full, if you are not hungry, right, you can't eat them. You'll vomit mm -hmm. if you are full. You, you'll vomit at the side. You might have experienced it, right? If, you are, if your stomach is too full, whatever food pics I show you, you'll vomit at the side of them, mm -hmm. right? So only when hunger exists, Tasty food can exist, right? So pain is always, uh, uh, pleasure is always uh, alleviation of pain. So so I get bored. That is some suffering. So to alleviate it, I am watching anime. I am playing video games, mm -hmm. right? And if I am capable of suffering, right, always there will be some people who are deprived of it. Yes. So even if 
if you say in in this world 99 people exist sorry 100 people exist and 99 people are experiencing net positive life one of them is starving mm-hmm. still we should give importance to that one person who is starving and we should press the red button okay i think i've got a better sense of where you're coming from then i um seems um there are a couple things going on there i think you you began implying maybe there was a kind of incommensurability you know philosophers call it between uh positive and negative experiences meaning they they can't be uh calculated within a sort of consistent <laughs> va- assassination of values um i guess or 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 less radically maybe you you could say that the disvalue of suffering is so intense that it radically outweighs the positives we could we could tip, typically name and uh, uh that i guess the former point would be a, a like a philosophical logical uh point and the uh latter point would be a little more empirical it would be something we could maybe um investigate as as you were by giving sort of examples you know you talked about anime and uh, the suffer- suffering of starvation and how you'd weight the uh, interests of the 99 against the one um personally i find it hard to uh know exactly how to weight these things so if i had the red button i would at least uh hesitate an awful long time because of some uncertainty i have about how to assign these values but let me let me um assume i haven't made any grave errors in uh, summarizing or drawing at least some some of your points out there um maybe push back a little bit what what about a kind of behaviorist or behavioral criterion of value where i guess you can ask an informed adult someone who's had some experience of the ups and downs of life whether they'd want to continue uh, on the assumption that there'd be roughly the same uh, variety of pains and pleasures sufferings and joys that they've experienced so far let's say you ask a 40 year old whether they'd want to continue to the age of 80 knowing there might be uh, say a year of illness and suffering at the end uh, i mean that might be a fairly typical case and some decline but though it is hard to assign like a, like a numerical value to these different positive and negative experiences this behavioral test is one way of kind of comparing the negatives and positives an informed liver <laughs> could say well uh yeah i know what life's all about i mean it's it's not all roses but i still think it's worth it right um i would like another 40 years you could even abstract a little bit more and think about a little bit about a kind of veil of ignorance you know um kind of like uh, john rawls veil of ignorance where potential inhabitants of a of a given polity um are stripped of knowledge of what particular position they'll occupy in the coming society um and they together they kind of negotiate a set of rules which will be just for all potential inhabitants you can imagine a similar kind of veil of ignorance covering all of nature and you could imagine beings who've they have some like raul says these these negotiators have some empirical knowledge of human nature and the sciences they just don't know whether they're going to be black or white or rich or poor in the society and and tall or short and what not and similarly you could imagine uh negotiators <laughs> behind the veil of ignorance prior to their incarnation into nature and um they don't know whether they're going to be a beetle or a or a human um or a squirrel um they don't know if they'll be born with a congenital illness or not but they ha- they've had some experience you know in their prior incarnations of 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 a variety of life and you could you could i can at least imagine um that informed um souls uh, i'm not assuming metaphysical souls exist here it's just a figure of speech to get get this thought experiment uh, off the ground these these incarnating souls with knowledge of the way things work in nature might say yeah you know what 
put me in again, coach, <laughs> send me in again. I'd like to take another, I'd, I'd like to take another go. It's worth it. You know, it's worth it. And I think a lot of people on their deathbed have a similar kind of view. Now it could be those people, humans on the deathbed are part of that privileged minority. And um, it might be that if, you know, a beetle could articulate at the end of their life, whether it was worth it, uh, you know, a lot of insects might say, no, this was a kind of hell. And I didn't, even have the option of suicide because I didn't have enough autonomy and awareness of these options. And uh, the problem of suicide is increasingly, as I understand it, the problem that a lot of beings, and this might show some of my sympathy for your, your view, that humans are privileged in part because we have the option of taking ourselves out consciously if things get really bad. And I'm not sure that option is quite available to a lot of other inhabitants of nature. But anyway, I guess I'm just pushing back a little bit by suggesting I'm not totally convinced about the, 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 um, I'm not sure personally about how to weight all these different values, uh, but I, I hear where you're coming from. I mean, I don't want to romanticize the natural world and there's an awful lot of suffering there. And uh, I appreciate that you're coming from a place of ahimsa of, of some kind of concern or compassion for those who suffer. And just in your view, the implication of this is something which sounds quite, uh, quite uh, destructive and maybe even to an un uninformed listener, it might sound like you're an evil genius sadist or something, but your your, your motivation is actually coming from a, a nice place. Uh, but um, yeah, I'll just I'll just let you take over uh, there I, without a particular uh, pointed question for you, but I'm sure you've got lots to say. Yeah, so one, one thing you mentioned in between is that people in deathbeds would say that, yeah, yeah, I've seen them. They, they seen some of them say that, uh, you know, uh, life is worth it. I, I just need a few more years, right? So here you need to understand two, three things. So first is that you just take an animal, right? You chop off its limbs, right? The animal will still try to get away from you, right? Once it escapes with those two limbs, the animal would still try to survive, right? That doesn't mean that uh, that is the best thing for the animal, right? So even if you say 40 year, 50 year old humans, they still might believe in, uh, you know, uh, supernatural shit, right? Even if they are old, that doesn't mean that they are rational. That doesn't mean that they have overcome their natural instincts to survive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you get an intuition, right? Because survival instincts are embedded in your brain. Right. That's how you survive for this long. That's obviously a part of your genetics. Right. So obviously your intuition will be against extinctionism. Right. So that doesn't mean that it has to be logical or it has to be helpful for you, beneficial for you as a sentient being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First thing. So on the Second thing. Let's say that I have an option, right? Uh, it's not going to be this way because, um, you know, practically when you actually accomplish extinctionism, uh, uh, sorry, extinction of all sentient beings, it, it's going to be in a mass scale. But but let, let me just go with the hypothetical. Hypothetically, if somebody says that uh, they want to live, Right, they, they want to continue existing, um, and um, let, let's even say that they are just above eighteen. Right, uh, they are pro life. They wa they want to live, and there is an option that we can selectively make others extinct, the animals, the rest of them who want to go extinct or who can't consent. Right, so I would go for it. I would say life is the best punishment for a pro-lifer. 
So, so just a second. I, I'll finish. So I I am a privileged person, right? So the, the finally when we are actually accomplishing extinction of all sentient beings, it it wouldn't be so. So we have some technologies that are upcoming, right? So like vacuum decay. These and all are theoretical possibilities that can accomplish extinction, right? So these are not going to leave room for you know a few people surviving. But the thing is that when it comes to uh, a point where we cannot choose who should survive and who shouldn't, um, we should prioritize those who are suffering and still press the red button. you get what i'm saying i think so yeah right so yeah. Uh, just because a few privileged people are saying that okay i want to continue existence doesn't mean that uh, millions of people starving and uh, you know uh, billions of women getting raped right not billions like if you uh, consider nature rape happens like each second mm-hmm. right so uh, billions and billions of animals getting suffocated and uh, you know they are stuck in natural disasters they are starving they are in uh, search of water and um, right they are, they are in some diseases mm-hmm. right so i am going to prioritize them over mm-hmm. privileged people like me <clears throat> yeah right? yeah so, uh, one guy is saying that okay okay i want to finish one piece so i have to con- uh, continue this existence full of rapes and uh, you know torture and uh, natural disasters and diseases this uh, does this statement sound ethical to you i guess again it depends a bit on um i still think net net value is important here i mean i i i'm i'm okay with the idea of prioritizing elimination of suffering you know over <clears throat> correlative gains and um pleasure or or happiness um so suff- <laughs> our priority should be on eliminating bad things over um maximizing good things i i think suffering is very bad <laughs> um and uh but i guess just the the question of what to do with that red button um in principle i'm still quite unsure and i hope in practice i would i would hesitate partly has to do with i guess some kind of implied consent criterion and competence you know on behalf of all those animals i don't even i don't i don't have enough sort of zoological understanding of the insect world to 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 know how it all balances out i, I mean i'm aware of our selection and, and all the horrors implied in that ratio of you know the wastefulness of nature in the way it reproduces and all the suffering of the young or sort of cast aside in natural selection that our selection kind of strategy might give you good reason to to think the net value of say insect life um and a lot of small animal life might be heavily weighted to the negative but there's just there's just yeah um here here's another uh maybe um I mean rather than trying to respond directly to each each thing you said we could talk again about the deathbed <laughs> um I mean you have a particular portrait of what's going on on the deathbed there um it's interesting I mean I th- I think I agree that a portion of what's happening when someone says on their deathbed that they do it all again it's just it's a transference um or transposition of the survival instinct into this um instead of instead of transposed into a future which they know they no longer have they're projecting it back onto their past it's 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 an interesting idea and i think there's something to it i don't know if it totally explains you know um an informed judgment on a deathbed that they would do it all again i think some of that judgment or some of those judgers um would would, would be fairly rationally making an assessment about the, the the net value of their 80 years on earth or whatever um and they're not just it's not it can't be completely reduced to um a kind of subrational impetus of the survival instinct but uh, we we can talk more about that if you want but i i was wondering um trying to keep god i 
I, I'm happy to keep God out of the picture as much as possible. I wouldn't personally identify confidently as a theist, but I'm open to some metaphysical extravagance in my worldview and and the weird and wonderful, um, even if there's not a traditional theistic God who's uh, omnipresent and eternal. I, I think the universe is a big enough place um, that just, just given natural selection, um, technological civilizations could achieve pretty extraordinary abilities, um, kind of like Arthur C. Clarke's godlike aliens, you know, um, in, in the vast reaches of a species history, it could, it could, it could attain what would be functionally to us a kind of godlike status and have some control over increasing scales of planets and solar systems and even universes. I, I don't know. I mean, um, but, but for now, maybe keeping gods out of the, well, keep keeping the, um, you know, theist, traditional theistic perfect being out of the picture, at least. What do you, what do you say to this? Um, granted, you know, we've had 500 million years of, of the nervous system here on earth and it's been a bit of a horror show, you know, I mean, it's, it's, um, um, this, the great slaughter bench of history. I mean, it's been hard. You could, you could, you could, uh, do a kind of, you know, worst of <laughs> compilation on YouTube or something and show those 500 million years in a pretty horrific light, which would impel a lot of people to want to push that red button. But I mean, perhaps there's been a kind of progress, especially maybe recently in the case of, of humans, of humans where we're gaining a competence to control our environment and control our future and mitigate some of those horrors. And we're also gaining a, an ability to morally universalize and, and um, take a kind of stewardship role over, over the earth. And I guess my, one of my concerns about the red button, one of the things which might lead me to hesitate is that I would feel like maybe I don't have the right to do this because maybe there's, there's some, some arc here that we're on. And if we push the red button, that makes those 500 million years of suffering worthless, right? It didn't cash out in the end. If let's say we're 200 years away or 2000 years away, or even 2 million years away from, I don't want to say like paradise on earth, you know, like the <laughs> Isaiah, you know, lying, laying down with lamb and, you know, Eden at the end of time or anything like, like that. Um, but something a lot better than what we've seen so far. I guess if 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 we we can end up somewhere fairly positive, um, you wouldn't want to push the red button so late in the game, right? The red button then becomes a kind of temptation, which arises maybe only late in the game, right? It, it arises only in the purview of a very intelligent, competent species who has begun to morally universalize and think about these called existential questions, and that that you know so. The point in history at which a red button becomes available, both in thought experiment and in reality, is maybe a point when you're at least potentially close in the arc of an ecosystem's progress to to something pretty good relative to what's happened so far. And then you push the red button, and and we've got to maybe maybe life will inevitably, you know, given natural selection, just start again from the ground up again. And it's better to let it play out a little bit, and then you get this, uh, you know, cosmic benign alien or something. I don't know. Uh, I mean, we're getting into sci-fi ter territory here, but I'll let you uh, maybe take it from there. Okay. So, first of all, um, the we shouldn't have an attitude that okay, we have uh, su suffered this much, and it has to cash into something. Right. So, um, actually, we know that reality is meaningless. Right. So, um, I mean, um, let's say that, uh, you know, you become a teacher. Right. Uh, you become an, uh, you become a firefighter. Ultimately, what you have accomplished, you have uh, ran around this world pointlessly and you have died. And it cashed into nothing. Let me come come to the technology part uh, to sort of connect this to. Um, so the internet, which we are talking on right now, we are talking about ethics, right? Which is a good thing. 
so internet has accomplished a lot of good things right so why it came into existence because we wanted to solve the problem of communication to make uh, information available to communicate more easily right so it did solve the problem and i guess you are talking from us and i'm talking from india so uh, we are spreading ethics so i think it did the job right but after solving these problems we also have a dark side of the internet mm-hmm. right so there is something called it's it's literally a dark net right where people do crimes they upload videos of uh, child pornography they upload videos of uh, uh, you know uh, animals getting tortured so that sadists can watch it and get off of it right so whatever humans you are you are thinking that you are taking something into control right but it's actually not the case whatever you invent whatever uh, even you take that uh, uh, take an example of uh, social justice movement no need for technology you say uh, animal rights right after you liberate all the animals it means that reforestation is going to happen right so animals are going to suffer in nature so instead of farmed animals suffering we just took the suffering and transferred it to the wild animals mm-hmm. so whatever technology or social reforms or ethics we invent we uh, get into this existence it does not solve suffering so suffering just changes forms yeah but as long as sentient beings exist suffering will exist it's so as simple I, as that so yeah, no. <laughs> if you are like uh saying like again this uh, optimism bias that we have to cast the suffering into something arises from survival instinct again optimism uh is so so you are not a lion right you are more evolved so to to keep survival to keep your survival instinct to sustain your survival instinct to defend your survival instinct you are taking optimism as a defense mm-hmm. which is not a right thing to do right because always whatever technology you bring it can be used for crime mm-hmm. right and it is subject to politics which is basic logic right so some people will be deprived of some things always it will always be survival of the fittest mm-hmm. always always some people so you and me uh, we are privileged because we are fit it's as simple as that so if if you are not fit so this is an intellectual world if you are not intellectually fit your life is going to be miserable yes mm-hmm. so always it will be like survival of the fittest so how can you hope to uh, you know uh, counter that in future because always a lion is going to want to eat a zebra mm-hmm. what can you do about it well uh, i guess uh, so yes, if if yeah Yeah, so go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead. Oh, well, yes. I, I mean, you've provided a nice segue into, you know, we talked about two two topics, related topics, and I think you gave us a, at least a skeleton of your um take on veganism. I mean, in talking about how um even if we even if the world goes vegan, that's not going to going to end animal suffering. Um it's just going to transpose the suffering into the wild <laughs> in larger numbers. Um um I guess sometimes i think about you know life on earth i mean there's this uh judeo christian idea of living in a fallen world you know fallen from some edenic paradise i don't suppose that's literally true but 
there might be like with a lot of mythic ideas a, 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 a deep truth or possibility expressed in that idea and I thinking about it on the, in in evolutionary terms I sometimes wonder if you know in the history of our particular biosphere maybe we got a slightly horrific version of a biosphere you know biospheres in principle can go all sorts of ways um and you know we're in a biosphere where things started eating each other <laughs> very early on in before they were unconscious but then that that um hetero um consumption became painful once the nervous system arose through pressures of natural selection and it just it just that it was like this kind of horror just kind of blooming into conscious existence i don't know hundreds of millions of years ago but you know when you think kind of on a spectrum of the ways ecosystems can go the way interspecies relations can go the way intraspecies relations can go there there is a spectrum there at least in conceptual space I guess we'd need a biologist or an ecologist or a zoologist to help us work through the empirical viability of the different a, options on the spectrum. But, you know, I I'm mean, a biotechnologist. Oh, you are, are you? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I mean, feel free to talk we, to me about anything. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is a spectrum there in terms of, for example, consumption. I mean, we can see that there's some relationships which are a bit more symbiotic than predatory, right? So, like the relation of animals with fruit trees. I mean, that's a mutually beneficial, I mean, I'm not supposing it's ideal, but it's a mutually beneficial relationship. And you could at least conceive of an ecosystem that's a bit more weighted towards symbiotic relationships. I think that's part of the picture that's kind of being uh, painted in these uh, religious ancient images of paradise where it's uh, the relations between species and within species is a bit more symbiotic, mutually beneficial. And uh, natural selection might not favor that particularly. That just might be one way things can work out. Um, but once beings become a little bit conscious and start to morally universalize, they can start pushing a, a, an ecosystem a bit more towards um, symbiotic, favoring you know, in the garden of life, we start to become the gardener and we start to favor the symbiotic relationships. Um, so I don't know if I, you know, I mean, I've got a lot of sympathy with Buddhism and with the view that life is suffering and this view, which you spoke of earlier, that even in our pleasures, even when we're being satisfied, there's a kind of, there's a way of negatively even characterizing what seems to be positive. Uh, I mean, I think that is, I mean, that's the first noble truth of Buddhism, right? That life is suffering, uh, dukkha. Um, it's unsatisfactory that even when you're, you think you're being fulfilled, it's, it's, um, there's a groping still going on there, or there's a, just a temporary satiation. Uh, well, I guess, um, on, on the veganism question here, here's, here's, okay, let me give you a little thought experiment, um, in terms of what's preferable, you know, veganism or just, um, um, letting things return to the wild. Um, or sorry, veganism, or just continuing with the current factory farm system. Um, okay, if you had if you had uh, five friends who were uh, chained inside a, a shed, you know, ten foot by ten foot shed, and there was some sadist who was, I don't know, deriving some kind of pleasure from torturing them for their existence. Wouldn't you feel some kind of uh, compulsion, uh, maybe even a moral? morally principled compulsion to uh, get them out of there, to rescue them from there. And the, I mean, the fact that, well, if, if, if you got them out of there and then the shed just fell to seed and was reclaimed by the wild, there would be 10 by, you know, 100 square feet there of wild nature where insects were eating each other alive and, and so on. Would that, would that be um, enough to dissuade you from the moral duty let's say to rescue your friends right like like i guess I, I guess i'm maybe maybe it's obvious i'm trying to draw a bit of an analogy there to a factory farm situation where the shed is an industrial scale shed where instead of five friends it's fifty thousand chickens or something and you could i mean it, they might be friends in a sense that you know people who get involved with animals 
do often develop a kind of friendship relationship um, with with a particular species that they care about them and they want them to be well and they enjoy their company too. And uh, so it's maybe uh, not such a stretch to think that a, a vegan could, you know, especially like a liberationist vegan could think in a similar way that um, it's worth it. You know, if it's worth it taking down that torture shed, even if it's reclaimed by nature, um, I guess there's a question of concentration of suffering still, right? Humans in the industrial age have gained an ability to just concentrate life and its suffering into a small area um, in a way which might be a bit more dispersed in nature. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just let you uh, respond yeah. to whatever you want, including including that thought experiment. Yeah. Um... Okay. Should should I respond to that uh, symbiotic uh, relationship question as well? Sure. You yeah, whatever, whatever you uh, feel inspired. Uh, uh, about symbiotic relationship. Um, so there is a rule. Predators should... There are oblig obligatory carnivores, right? They absolutely need meat. Right? So um, let's say that, uh, you know... Mm. Obviously, predation is not the only problem in the wild, right? Uh, there is starvation, right? So if if a lion is not going to control the population of a deer, starvation and diseases are going. To. It's as simple as that. So the deer suffers anyway, and the lion suffers anyway. So the thing is that, let's say a bird eats a berry, right? And it takes the seed of the berry, far away and it uh, drops it into the soil. That is a symbiotic relationship, right? So in this case, the berry plant doesn't feel pain. You imagine a deer donating a limb or a... <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, so uh, when it comes to sentient, sentience, there will be suffering and yeah. Uh, there are some uh, birds who sit on bisons, wild boars, and they eat the uh, pests, ticks that infest those animals. It's good for the bison and the wild boar and the bird that is eating the pest. But is, is it good for the pest is a question. Right, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, most people, they hate, uh, you know, uh, pests. They think that, okay, they can be killed. I say that, yeah, I, I do hit mosquitoes. I think I hit one right here, right? So that is for self-defense. But whether it's a bad event or not can be discussed. If the mosquito is sentient, then it's definitely, if, if it's feeling some sort of a negative stimuli, then it's definitely a bad event, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I hope that answers the question of insects as well. And there is uh, something called as universal declaration of consciousness, which you can read, uh, which will give you a better idea of. It's not a. It's not a research paper. It's it's a direct declaration. Cambridge Universal Declaration of Consciousness. And uh, maybe when I upload this video in my channel, I'll add a link of it, so you can check that about insect consciousness and all. Do they, so do, they do they declare there that insects are likely conscious? Sent what? Out? Does, yeah, does they, the declaration? They are, yeah. yeah, they they are up to a level, not not as much as humans, obviously, but up to a level. So they they do feel obviously negative stimuli, right? So uh, if you hit a cockroach, you might have seen it run away from the broomstick um, you are hitting with. Mm -hmm. So. That is one one thing, and uh, second thing about veganism, I have seen uh, a, a lot. A lot of my friends have asked me this question. Yeah, like you know, in nature, they have a chance to escape. the The, the room is bigger, right? Mm -hmm. Um, at least in nature, these animals have freedom, mm -hmm. right? So. I am someone who thinks that uh, comparing suffering 
which suffering is greater when it comes to intense suffering is something that is wrong so you cannot say that you know uh, starvation is a bigger suffering than rape you can't do it don't don't compare it both are in intense suffering and both deserves to be stopped first thing second thing is that um so so yeah if if uh, freedom is a problem in um farms and slaughter houses uh, in nature it is continuous search for food and water tomorrow you cannot be sure whether you will get water or food tomorrow you cannot be sure like uh, what disease you are going to get right and uh, this um, nature in nature wild animals have a chance to escape from predators is bullshit let's say that a deer has a 50 50 chance of escaping a lion okay it gets lucky it escapes the lion starves let's forget that part for once then again uh, there is a 50 50 chance that it will get hunted tomorrow if it gets lucky each and every time finally it's going to be natural death mm -hmm. that is going to be worse than a slaughter house right yeah so it's going to take longer yeah right yeah. so um, uh so so i'm i'm not saying that uh, you, you know uh, factory farms are uh, lower suffering than nature or nature is more suffering than uh, factory farms but i am saying that it is pointless to fight which suffering is greater both should be eradicated <laughs> and for yeah. both extinction is the solution right well, uh, mm -hmm. um yeah i mean i admire your uh hatred of suffering if i could call it that i mean I, i again i'm sympathetic with this view that it's such a bad thing that it's almost indecent to try to compare you, you said rape versus starvation i i i do wonder if again a sort of behaviorist criterion of comparison could be could be argued for where someone who's had experience of both you know starvation and rape might still i mean well acknowledge that they're terrible thing. uh what is what is this behaviorism i i just uh sorry sorry to clarify i just mean that um you you can make a conclusion i guess about which is worse between a and b based on what informed agents would tend to choose between them so someone who's had a, an informed agent here would be someone who's had experience of both starvation and rape and if 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 we could show that those who've had both tend to if they have to choose between the two of them choose starvation say i don't know i don't then I, i you know as 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 hesitant as so, i am to compare so these two if, awful if things veganism, if, if veganism requires you to choose between rape and starvation to justify some things Uh -huh. isn't it a ba bad ethics to have i i hear you i hear you yeah you, you i'm just i guess you should yeah. ask a victim that whether he would choose rape or starvation the thing is that we should declare that both rape and starvation should be eradicated and hence hence extinctionism yeah yeah, yeah. okay uh uh so i but i was just making maybe the at least to start with the logical point that they could still be compared so i i guess i was just questioning that that premise but still if they're both very bad even if they can be compared if they're both very bad extinction the red button might might be the correct inference from that um you know i mean it's it's a very rich empirical question about what would be worse um and and how how much worse if worse the uh you know square mile of factory farm versus the square mile of wild reclaimed nature you, you, you did, again I, again it depends on a particular uh, circumstance animal farms if you take it it's not just factory farms right you do have free range farms right these so these days what, i think they're what, smaller smaller and smaller what, percentage what, what vegan a uh, vegan tend to do is that they take factory farms and then they compare it to 
uh, a region of uh, forest where some monkeys live without predators you know a lot of food and stuff mm-hmm. right but that is not a right comparison if you take factory farms you compare it to a desert i i can also uh, make, make uh, i i can also bring this up as an argument right so you you take a desert region famine uh, ridden region drought ridden region nothing is growing no food no water animals have to abandon their children their own children in order to get to water because children are a burden mm-hmm. right so um you compare that to a factory farm right yeah, yeah. you then you are uh, is is just mentality right you you are thinking that uh, you know factory farms you have seen some uh, horrible videos about factory farms so you are imagining that and you are imagining a a, 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 a lush green forest where you know rabbits are playing around happily right and i'm not saying that uh, in a lush green forest animals will be happy you you just take a look at it and the rabbit babies you can see it will be eaten by ants alive baby rabbits mm-hmm. this does happen very commonly if you <laughs> if you are someone who has spent a lot of time in nature this is a very common thing baby animals being eaten by ants yeah slowly yeah, yeah. this might be highly specific for you and whatever thing that happens in farms it happens in nature as well for example if you take uh, a rape it happens in nature if you take starvation it happens in nature right it does so the only difference is that uh, you think that animals in nature are free but it comes along with a price that is you have to be in constant uh, search for food and water you have to be in constant fear of predators you have to be subject to harsh weathers and uh, natural disasters forest fires you you are you are going to burn alive literally if you are, if you got stuck right yeah. so it's it's really not a good idea to compare uh, you know factory farms and wild so so another point i would um, uh make it clear in my every video uh, about veganism is that i am not someone who supports factory farms mm-hmm. i'm just pointing it out to you that uh both both ha- both have um, animal suffering and you shouldn't be a speciesist right mm-hmm. so a fish does not care if it suffocates on a whale's mouth or a human neck yeah both suffering is same for the fish you don't matter here whether the suffering is human caused or nature caused it doesn't matter victims matter their suffering matters mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. when it comes to ethics if you say that okay uh, we should only stop human made suffering let let uh, naturally uh, suffering children in africa starve and die it won't be a good statement to me mm-hmm. yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, I I do appreciate your point that when we're comparing, say, a factory farm to nature, we shouldn't take, or when when we're comparing animal agriculture rather to nature, we shouldn't compare the worst of animal agriculture uh, to the best or even a romanticized version of nature. That's that's absolutely right, and uh, we should fight against both suffering. It's as simple yeah, as that. Even yeah, factory farms, um, if you, if you say that. these cows right uh, most of the cows in factory farms they'll uh, um, i i think uh, um, when i used to be a vegan activist i used to remember i think the breed is called jersey right jersey yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so these cows uh, certain cows they'll be able to give 20 liters of milk they'll have very large udders right so even if you liberate these cows every second they exist will be painful for them yeah yeah if, well, actually, if you that's... liberate factory farmed chickens they are bred to become big right right so they won't yeah. be able to walk 
right yeah yeah so yeah. the second living itself will be a difficult thing for them so right. even if, if you liberate let's say uh, these vegans they manage to achieve animal liberation tomorrow the solution for farmed animals is euthanasia you have to euthanize yeah. them even if you take them and uh, you know g- get them to a sanctuary not that i'm saying that uh, billions of cows and chickens you can keep them in a sanctuary tomorrow but even if you are theoretically able to do that <laughs> it won't be beneficial for them they'll still be st- suffering in the sanctuary existence itself is difficult for them you have to euthanize them right yeah. so extinction yeah. is the solution to farm the animals as well and wild animals well if i could just jump in there i mean um actually your point about the viability of these animals you know outside of the system we've we've raised them and bred them within now um maybe maybe i could come at that from from a different perspective to 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 just show no, i'm, I'm I mean, not talking about the viability i i couldn't care less about whether an animal can survive or not uh, the viability, thing is that, uh, that was sorry suffering. i should have said that. yeah the, the 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 quality of the of the life the freed the free the free yeah. jersey cow's life well i mean I, i guess a vegan could more radically argue then that before we liberate these animals we we owe them something like genetic reparations i mean it's more acute in the in the case of lab animals who in many many cases they're strains of rats or mice who've been bred to be disease prone right i mean they certainly can't be liberated as is um you know they've been bred to have a very ill form of life from you know congenitally in many many cases you know diabetes prone or i read a paper by brett weinstein um where he argued that almost accidentally as as a result of lab breeding practices of laboratory mice over the decades um they've become cancer prone um where whereas their their wild ancestor was fairly fairly resistant the cancer actually was not an issue for mice in the wild and not just because of their uh, shorter shorter uh life through predation but um i guess there there are a few things i i wanted to, a couple few threads there but I, i should maybe pick and choose a little bit but but on this point of um to stick with this point of you know the fact that these released animals who are currently under human control would would have uh you know I have a lot, have a lot of suffering minute by minute in the case of the, of, of the uh, dairy cow um i i guess that shows maybe that what you know the kind of control that humans have exhibited over animals in the system of animal agriculture is so totalizing you know cradle to grave and it has involved not just predating at the end of an animal's life but shaping the very form of the animal's life to suit human needs like turning a cow into a milk machine for our 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 des- to fulfill our desires and that that shows maybe there is a kind of suffering that goes on in the case of animals under human control that's a little bit distinct if not in kind than degree from what animals undergo in nature right i mean i i agree that i mean every animal gets killed in the wild many of them through predation um and so again I mean, to say that I animals can't make this point enough distinct different suffering doesn't mean that uh, you know you can get to say that this suffering is better and this suffering is uh... no no but my point is that when you are controlling a species from cradle to grave and shaping their form of existence is something that's kind of minute by minute painful for them right like in the case of these broiler chickens who have very weakened limbs and uh, probably it's very painful for them to even stand up once they're at full size i mean this is exhibiting a kind of it's like we're predating them but we're not just predating them at the oh, very yeah. end of their life we're so, so predating me... them all the way through their lives and controlling them castrating them tail docking beak cutting i mean we're doing things from the very beginning of their life and then confining them and i guess on that point you know when i watch squirrels in the backyard and and what not i mean i i don't want to romanticize i mean there i do that's that's the problem it's... that i that, that's the problem that i pointed out you you are watching squirrels in the backyard right so um you cannot really use that as an example to judge nature as a whole and uh, squirrels in your backyard isn't even in nature they are they are living in cities 
to be really honest and uh, let me give you an example so in india there are a lot of dairy farms right so if you look at them from uh um if you if you are just walking by on the road right you will see a lot it, it is not like uh, mo most of the farms here is not like factory farms or anything people have cows in india like uh, 10 cows a home in villages right in rural, rural area so if you walk by these villages you would think that these cows are having the time of their life to be really honest but actually if you visit them at a particular season they'll be doing all sorts of cruelty they'll be doing nose piercing they'll be doing uh, you know uh, artificial insemination and uh, they'll be starving the male calves they'll be doing all kinds of shit and i I've, i've seen this okay but when i do uh, when i used to do animal rights activism in india when i used to explain this to people people would ask me like you know just some cows are standing what's the problem yeah the problem is you don't know the problem <laughs> you don't live with them 24 by 7 Yeah, right yeah yeah the thing is that it might uh, if you if you work with animals in nature so uh, if if you see i told you one example right these baby animals they are often eaten by ants when they are alive if an ant in, in infests a, a nest or a, a you know a, a small uh, den where a rabbit lives right the mother won't be able to save the rabbits it won't be right i have seen this is not a single case or uh, anything i am talking about this happens a lot in nature this might be really specific ants eating baby animals when i say it out loud but it happens really commonly mm -hmm. so these rabbits uh, uh, even even squirrels i have seen squirrels which you mentioned right these squirrels are in the one you will be uh, seeing in your backyard because they would be dead and nature again you are saying that um uh you know um uh, these mice in nature are uh, cancer resistant right how did they get this way okay nature doesn't have a way to give beneficial to select and give beneficial mutations to organisms okay there is no uh, way in cell biology or molecular biology that uh, you can only select and get beneficial mutations natural selection happens randomly mm -hmm. 10 mice will be born five of them will be resistant to cancer five of them will be born with lower immunity mm -hmm. the five that are born with lower immunity will die yeah. and these five other five will be selected and this yeah. process is something that is constant right so along with this mice the the the, the disease uh, ca causing virus the disease causing bacteria this will also be evolving Mm -hmm. yeah. yes so definitely yeah. it's a constant battle and you only see uh, the healthy ones most of the time because the other ones are dead they didn't survive it's as no, simple true. as true true i'll just i'll just briefly uh respond to to that and then i guess we should uh, recognize and welcome extinctionists into the room but uh, uh the squirrel point i mean i was just i was just pointing out and i i didn't mean to use the squirrel as a stand in for what's typical in nature but i i do i mean you characterize their existence as anxious and i i i guess well recognizing that anxiety we can also recognize another dimension of that anxiety which is like a no no, no. wait just just, uh, just, I, just I let me let me finish let me finish here 
there's an anxiety there in, in being alive. I mean, I feel it and I assume it's there in almost any sentient creature, especially one who's out there trying to find its food and water, but, and take care of its young in very uh, unforgiving circumstances. But I do also think there's, again, the flip side of anxiety phenomenologically, experientially is some like a vitality, a will to live, even a kind of joy in being alive, a joy in movement and expressing one's competence and freedom, you know? Like, um, I think the point vegans make when they're comparing a free wild animal to an animal who's confined in a cage, I mean, like in a rabbit farm where they're usually put in a position where they can't even stand up, let alone jump or run. And uh, my experience with rabbits is that a lot of their joy in life and being alive and I think it is there, I'd be willing to call it a kind of joy, which is there alongside the anxieties and so on. But the, the joy is in, in movement and expressing those competencies. Like when you see a, a rabbit run free, there's a, a joy in that. And so, I, I mean, even when it's escaping predation, I mean, this is an extreme case, but there's a kind of fear there, which I think would be the overwhelming experience of that, but also a kind of, I mean, I've been chased by someone who was trying to kill me before. And if I, when I look back on that experience, it was, um, I mean, it was, there was a lot of fear there, but there was also a kind of, in, insofar as I was getting away, um, there was a kind of joy in, in, in expressing that competence and a, a kind of wonder in being alive, you know, I don't want to romanticize it, but, and project from my limited experience of being predated to, uh, uh, to all of nature, but just, just to maybe balance a little bit, your characterization of, of, of animal life has just, you know, cradled a grave anxiety. Um, I think that there could be an anxiety there that's persistent, but there's something else. It's almost like a different facet of that same thing we call anxiety if we're thinking a little pessimistically or glass is half empty and when we see things a little more glass is half full we can think of that anxiety in terms of vitality and uh just the, the joy of movement and freedom and expressing competence and so on so but you know the rabbits being eaten alive by ants i mean I, again i don't want to romanticize nature it's a horror show and mm -hmm. uh, the ideal you know if you think of the ideal hunting or the ideal uh, farming such uh, animal agriculture it could it could be superior certainly to what uh, what animals might experience in nature but the amount of control typically exercised in in farming even even in you know things that look a little distinct from factory farming there's an awful lot of control there over the reproductive life of the animal if not rape and and you know the way males are handled in the dairy industry and in, in um you know, the egg egg industry, I mean, they're expendable. And I don't think those things necessarily change when you scale it down. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I guess, uh, hello, uh, extinctionist. <laughs> Welcome to our uh, chat. Um, we've covered uh, the red button scenario already and uh, that sort of um, um, led into naturally a discussion of vegan, you know, the vegan, the vegan uh, utopia versus uh, factory farming situation and and the relative value, uh, but uh, you're uh, very welcome to chime in at any point, extinctionist. Okay, so about the will to live, right? As we discussed, even people in deathbed have will to live. Mm -hmm. People who are dying naturally, right? So will to live, not just is. Uh, the uh, being violated by humans who are doing farming, it, it can also be violated by nature. Right? So, you just imagine because of will to live, if we let this existence continue, right? So, essentially what we are doing is that we are allowing these animals to reproduce again and again and produce more and more animals which will die naturally or by predators or by humans and lose their will to live, uh, get their will to live violated, right? So even if you take will to live in into the argument, uh -huh. then as well, causing extinction is the only solution. And again, yeah. factory farming, as you said, I have never denied at any point in this video that factory farming is, uh, you know, something that is uh, 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 better than nature or anything. 
my only point is that we shouldn't compare both gotcha right gotcha. Gotcha. here if it is a uh, genetic modification there it is natural selection everything mm-hmm. causes suffering and yeah. we have to eradicate both yeah and regarding yeah. that joy that you get by escaping a serial killer <laughs> you just imagine i don't have a brother or a sister right so my parents decided that uh, you know that's it we'll just raise this guy and that's it so does that mean that my parents are depriving my potential brother or a sister the joy of escaping a serial killer <laughs> no right we are dragging see nature if we let it continue because of reproduction it is dragging new sentient they don't exist yet we are dragging them into this existence and then they want pleasure right right yeah. so <laughs> so you are not actually deprived of any pleasure if you don't exist you don't really want pleasure right well so uh, it's as simple as that yeah and yeah. Uh, another major thing that we have to understand is that uh, trolley problem so let's let's assume for a second let's forget extinctionism and assume that death is bad right so in one track there is five people and in another track there is one person right uh if death is bad which track will you direct the trolley to so obviously an ethical person would direct the tra- trolley towards the per- uh, track with the one person right basically that is extinctionism except this is one versus infinity so if you cause extinction right now suffering ends right now yes so if you let existence continue more beings are going to be born so they are going to want pleasure they are going to be deprived of it and they are going to suffer intensively they don't exist yet they haven't come into existent yet existence yet yeah right so it's basically uh, not a good point to say that uh, you know you are depriving someone of pleasure so they don't really want pleasure yet but if you come into this existence there is a chance of intense suffering which is really really a bad thing nobody deserves to get rape nobody deserves to burn alive nobody deserves to get a disease like cancer nobody no no child deserves to starve right nobody get, deserves to get tortured by a sadist or murdered by a serial killer nobody yeah. deserves any of this shit no i, and, I hear you yeah uh, and you cannot use privileged uh, a privileged person who is having a good quality of life cannot use his uh, privilege as an argument for uh, against the suffering to continue the existence against extinctionism yeah It cannot be done i think i hear i hear you steve yeah. uh I still wonder about that uh, veil of ignorance scenario I brought up earlier in a conversation. I just, I, I mean, I, I just wonder what the judgment of someone, an informed um, soul from behind that veil would say about the prospect of ex- existence, you know. Again, it's hard to extract f- um, from that posited person this... Um, latent will to survive which can get transposed in, in in all sorts of ways assumedly if they've been in the natural world and they have experience of it in a variety of lives in this thought experiment and now they're deciding whether it's worth incarnating again with the role of the die deciding what species you'll be in and what kind of life it'll be uh, they might be smuggling into their consideration I, i i acknowledge um some transposition of this will to survive uh you know <laughs> and so nature's endowed them um against their interests in a sense with a will to survive and then that that endowment leads them 
in this uh, from behind this veil of ignorance to say, yeah, throw me in again, put me in again. I'm willing. I know that life can be quite unfair and that bad, very bad things can and will happen to me, but I still think on balance, it's it's worth it. I'd rather that with the risk involved than the dark eternal void of non-existence um, for all, 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 all cosmic time, you know. Um, I guess there is eternal void. So this is one thing that everybody is afraid of, right? So what we actually imagine is that we are, uh, when we say like uh, uh, dark, lonely void, we often well, I imagine. I didn't say lonely. <laughs> I didn't say lonely. <laughs> we, we often, we often tend to go there. Imagine that loneliness, like. Yeah. People imagine, okay, them and their thoughts are suspended in some kind of, uh, you know, a space going forever and ever and ever. This is not the case, right? So non-existence is really, really simple. So uh, many people wouldn't have thought about this. But when you have a sound sleep, all that you will remember is going to sleep and waking up in the morning. Mm -hmm. In between, what was there? Did you have any depressive emotions, anxiety, nothing? I said sound sleep, no dreams, nothing. We might have, all of us might have had, had this in our life, right? One day of sound sleep without any dreams. So we can imagine what non-existence looks like. So if you don't wake up the next morning, you won't even know you didn't wake up. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Yeah, right? Yeah. And the other thing is that... Uh, Again, uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, uh, whether it is worth it, I would like to again make the point, even if 99 people are having pleasure and one person is starving, I would still press the red button. It would be more ethical to still press the red button. Again, we are comparing watching anime to starvation and saying that, okay, if more people watch anime, it's worth it. No, it's not. Yeah. Very simple. Well, you might Your be doing there. Instincts, uh, yeah, your natural instincts might say otherwise. You might be optimistic. Even I myself am privileged. Okay. I, I want people to finish One Piece. <laughs> I want that anime finished. <laughs> but still, tomorrow there is a red button and I have to press it. Ethically, I am obligated to prioritize suffering over my pleasure. If okay, not, to... I am acting like a privileged person. I am oppressing, I am uh, letting suffering happen. It, it all falls on me. Uh, okay, I, I would uh, just two, two things. One, very short. Uh, I do think in comparing the pleasures of anime watching <laughs> um, to starvation, you might be doing something analogous to what the vegan might do in thinking the worst case of animal agriculture and comparing that to an idealized version of nature. Instead of comparing starvation to anime watching, you might compare starvation, which is a, a seemingly a profound kind of suffering that life is subject to, to one of the more profound positive experiences in life. Like, uh, Can, you, can you name birth. one thing? Can you name one thing in this world that can justify uh, a child starving to get, uh, starving to death or, uh, you know, a child getting raped? Can you can you name one thing in this world that can justify it? Well, it pr probably so, so wouldn't can, be. You, can you acknowledge the fact that uh, with starvation, these kind of uh, sufferings, crimes, and uh, you know, uh, natural disasters, diseases, these things are inevitable. Can you acknowledge that? Uh, I agree. Uh, so far, they've been pretty yes. inevitable. I, so, I so, do... so moving on to the next question. So can you? Uh, name one thing that can justify a child starving to death. Can you well, name one positive thing that can justify? Well, I don't know about justify, but I, I would just make the point that if we're going to look for something a little bit, at least in, in the, in the uh, realm of comparison, you, you'd have to take something that is profoundly positive in life, like Thanks. birth of a the birth of a child or the birth love, of a child the, the birth the continue... of the child is what it, that it, that is the precise event that caused the ch child to starve in the first place the child yeah, but... was probably chilling in the void 
<laughs> yeah, but it, it it might it, yeah being born is a necessary condition of any. Uh, being born, born not. Uh, I think name something else. No, by birth of a child, I mean the first of all the experience, the profound relationship that develops between a mother and a child. So, okay, so, that, so, like, so what do you think? Of you a are child being, and... Don't you think you are being a little bit selfish because, uh, you know, um, when I argue with people who want to be parents, right? So they they uh, you know tell me this thing. Um, uh, you know, even if the child might suffer in future. I had joy now, but what about the child who is suffering in the future? Sure, sure. No, I, I I'm not. I'm this, not. Is, this is the this is the peak of selfishness. Do you understand? Yeah, no. yeah, so yeah no. For our joy, let, let me finish. No, no parent can guarantee their child's safety. So for our joy, what we are doing is that we are bringing a child into this existence, right? And uh, we are saying that that positive experience would justify all the uh, you know potential suffering that child might have that's the peak of selfishness because this child was never there you created a sentient you you, you do understand this uh, implication right you created a sentient being from the scratch a sentient being who is able to experience who has the capability to experience intense suffering you created him or her from scratch. You put them through hell and you say that, okay, uh, uh, you know, at least when I gave birth to the child, I was very happy. This is the peak of... So, so this is the same thing that, uh, you know, uh, even uh, uh, someone who is eating meat for pleasure would say. For my pleasure, this, this is the starting point of every cruelty there is. For my pleasure... For continuing my pleasure, for having pleasure, I will let suffering happen. I will not stop su suffering of other people. I will cause suffering of other people. There, okay. First of all, you're right. I mean, if 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 by birth of the child we're just talking about the uh, uh, positive experience of the mother for that, apart from the pain of childbirth. Uh, I, I mean, by birth of the child, I mean more the entry of this being into the world and the relationship that creates between the mother and the child. But even if even if we just look at it from the, the, the selfish point of view of the mother's interests, it still is something profound relative to maybe watching anime, though I don't want to slam aesthetic experience either. They they can be yeah, but some of again, our most... You, just, uh, just, 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 just a sec, just a sec. Let me work this out a little bit. So, but... Is, Moving out from the mother's own selfish interests too, I, I, you know, I mean, I think there are selfish parents out there for sure, and and probably every conscious act of parenting um, or bringing children into existence involves some selfish thinking or just not thinking at all. But but I, I do think there are a lot of people out there who, when they have children, they're they're doing it not just because they want the pleasure of this relationship, you know, in the same way that someone might get a cuddly pet because they're lonely. It's it's that they think life is worth living and they want someone else to have that experience and they want to almost like cultivate a particular version of that experience based on what they've learned about life in their own children, you know? Um, I mean, there's a kind of utopian program almost in, in having children in some cases where you recognize there are a lot of problems in the world. See, most, think... most, people, most people have children because of societal compulsion they want to prove their fertility. They want to have the joy of parenting. Let's say a, a, a very small minority wants uh, to have children because they want their children to experience uh, what life has to offer. Then that just means that they are optimism biased. It's a fact that no parent, no parent in this whole wide world can guarantee their child's safety. It is a fact. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So childbirth is a lottery. It's as simple as that. So so my life is good up till now. Whether it continues or not, tomorrow, whether I get murdered by a serial killer, <laughs> there is always a chance. Right. So I cannot say that. So even that minority of people 
who give birth to children because you know they want their children to experience pleasure or whatever delusions they might have they also do it because of optimism bias that is not a right thing to do i, I guess so and another thing is um which you told about that uh, okay yeah motherly love you can say it's more profound okay but i would still uh, you know i i would still prefer watching anime that is as already i told you this this is a subjective thing for me watching anime is sometimes it's more pleasurable than uh, you know something like uh, tasty food or sex it's as simple as that so it, it's a subjective thing let's say that okay it's more profound uh, a girl a, a little girl is being raped right uh her mother couldn't protect that girl okay probably the mother is also a victim can you go to this girl and say that but hey at least your mom loves you you can't do that well you can't do that so, sort of can i mean I, would, that, i wouldn't do it uh, right away but the, in the, the sense thing is that, yeah you wouldn't do it right away the thing is that whatever uh, obviously so even if you take a uh, some animals they exhibit a lot of motherly love right so i have i have some stray dogs over here my uh, sheep and uh, they take care of their babies they 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 cry they literally howl start howling when one of their babies die obviously motherly love is there but what can the what is that mother able to do with that motherly love the child died it's it's not worth anything you dragged someone into this existence they get raped they get killed and they and you say that okay at least your mother loves you your mother loving you came from evolution the mothers who took care of their children they were able to protect their species better it is again a part of survival it wasn't given to you so that you can enjoy your life nature doesn't care about you nature doesn't care about your suffering nature all nature wants is that uh, again i am not saying nature is conscious it's a figure of speech so all all that nature is going for is that replication of dna it's as simple as that whatever it gives you it doesn't mean it is beneficial for you it's as simple as that so definitely can you say that okay since motherly love exists um again you didn't answer my question let let me ask it again since motherly love exists you said that is more profound than anime so can it justify children getting raped or uh, children starving to death or diseases like cancer can it justify it can, sure, can you say that since motherly love exists these things can continue because if you say that life can continue because of motherly love you you are saying that these things are, can also continue that is the implication of it okay because you already agreed to the fact that these are inevitable diseases crime these things are inevitable so yeah. if you advocate for life continuing you are advocating for these things to also continue so right. is is so so let me uh, i i can perfectly this, this is a direct question does motherly love justify these things fair question i it does seem like it's even with that particular example you know motherly love versus child getting raped and killed that i mean that that's that's apparently a stand in for the larger question of the balance of bad things to good things both profound and trivial on both sides i guess it it does seem like it's a partly empirical psychological question you know and i'm not sure uh i'm not sure what the answer is you know and that's one reason it's not, I it's not a psychological question you are you are dragging you are making someone from scratch who might get raped in a justification that okay uh, you know uh, he will get to experience motherly love uh, for me i would tell you i i i already told you motherly love is not a big th- a big, big deal for me i i don't care even if my mom loves me or not i don't care yeah no for the empirical me, question peak of my, peak of my pleasure is it's it's really subjective 
uh let's uh, le- let's say that someone uh is born and they uh love their mother they experience motherly love but it still does just uh, does cannot justify any this is not a, i i wouldn't even say this is a matter of philosophy this is an absolute fact that uh you know uh, positives uh cannot justify intense suffering oh no i th- i think that's a philosophical a philosophical truth if it if it is one i but i think and and if that's true then yeah i guess maybe it's not an empirical psychological question I, but yeah to, to so, me, I, yeah just just a sec it, let me uh, let me let me uh, just let me just make my point here so you know where i'm coming from um it's an empirical psychological question in that we're we're way we're comparing things right and so the question is how bad experientially are the various things and in fact you know what's the ratio of the bad things to the good things so it's it's a vast empirical question especially if we're asking about all of nature not just within a single life or dyad of of, of human uh, relationship but um i guess you know nature t- t- to your point about nature endowing us with this will to survive and nature not caring natural selection not not care not caring about whether we enjoy life or not i i take your point that natural selection is indifferent to our well-being um but um in effect it endows us with um a kind of will to live and you can cast that in a negative light you can see that as a kind of chain a psychological chain a volitional chain that nature has strapped on us to make sure we stay in the game and become those lumbering ro- and persist as those lumbering robots <laughs> through which dna gets itself replicated as richard dawkins put it in, in the selfish gene but you could also again it's it's to me it does seem like it's a bit of a glass half full half empty question where you could you can see it as a chain but you could also see it as nature though not intrinsically caring about whether we enjoy life or not has an effect made us animals really into life you know so once it's 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 beings who are really into life um tend to stick around and tend to reproduce and and so i think in effect though nature didn't care about whether we enjoy life or not has created in in animal life as part of the picture as part of the complex psychological picture of what it's like to be alive beings who are really into it and and um you can say um it's not in their interest to to um okay. really. so that's, so, that's hard to uh hard to assess once they're into it they're into it you know and again zooming he, back he to that veil like, of ignorance scenario where it's it's like to me i'm still wondering what the correct answer would be behind that veil of ignorance where you're asked do you want to do it again and i can imagine like by the way i'm not that crazy about existence i mean the thought of a genuine void uh where i really don't exist i'm not i'm not upset about that thought i, I mean there's a part of me which is even looking forward to the extinction of death not that i'm suicidal or anything but it's like i don't think i fear death per se i mean i don't want to die painfully but it's 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 um sorry where was i going with that it's it's this you know to be here is to kind of be into in into life and uh, i'm just not sure uh, you know i take the red button seriously i don't just dismiss it out of hand as an outlandish um, okay Experiment, um, but I would I would hesitate to push it uh, on behalf of all these beings. I just don't feel competent to assess what their interests are here and what their will is here and what their implied consent would be. You know. See, first of all, uh, with regards to animals, they cannot think philosophy, right? They cannot think what is good, what is bad for them. They just they are into life. because they are programmed to be into life right uh, millions of years of evolution it has given them a genetics obviously this, this natural selection is not even a part of uh, you know life even chemicals are naturally selected stable compounds survive and stable compounds degrade right so th- this comes this is a basic concept of chemistry this is not a natural selection is not a basic concept concept of biology it's a basic concept of chemistry so when it comes to humans you really can't say that uh, your child will be really into life mm-hmm. definitely you can't say that 
and the major problem here is reproduction you are dragging someone who is non existent into this existence right animals can't think about it um, uh, you know uh, people who, even even people who are theists they can't think about it right see see they they uh, i i really don't believe uh, that much of a believer of free will so everybody has a certain intellectual capacity right so beyond that they will not be able to think it's as simple as that mm-hmm. everybody's um, intellect their philosophy everything is dis- determined by their uh, genetics their intellectual capacity uh, their emotional capacity <clears throat> especially people with higher emotions won't be able to think uh, logically right um <clears throat> so um, you really ca- cannot say these people are actually into life you can't say that first thing and the second thing as i said life is not about being into life or you know out of life or whatever you are dragging a being when you are reproducing when you are continuing existence you are drawing you, you are making sentient beings from scratch and they are coming into this world and experiencing negative things pointlessly they are just pointlessly suffering here and dying yeah right if if the if if your mom used a condom you weren't here it's as simple as that yeah right yeah. everybody says that okay i have a unique purpose no you don't you are just you are just an accident that happened one night it's as simple as that. <laughs> right yeah, yeah. if 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 they decided to use a different uh, condoms a different day you are totally different person right so it's as the, simple on, as that. on on the on the front end it's i i would acknowledge that in bringing a child into existence you're you're uh doing that without their prior consent um of course the red button is also taking everything out of existence without their explicit consent and then exactly. that's why there that's there remains this I kind of about. empirical <laughs> psychological question of what the what the quality of life is you know so that we can make some inference about what the implied consent would be in both at both ends you know in terms of being oh. uh, brought into existence and then being taken out and so i think we're both working with some empirical psychological intuitions about no. uh, the value of the value and relative no. value let, of these let, things let me, here let me make it clear so when you bring a life into this existence all life is mortal we don't have any immortal beings here i guess uh-huh. right all life is mortal is going to die one day and uh, <clears throat> uh especially when it comes to sentient life they have a very really very short life span right so um so they are going to die anyway <laughs> their consent is being violated they suffer they die in between they reproduce they birth new generation which is going to suffer and die again in between they will reproduce they, they are going to uh, suffer and die again so this cycle continues extinction might violate consent yes but it finishes that violation of consent once and for uh-huh. all uh-huh. that Got is you. what of this trolley yeah. problem question yeah. so i am not saying that uh, uh i i will i'll never say that uh, you know violation of will to live or uh, you know uh, violation of consent is a good thing right the thing is that life is not so black and white right mm-hmm. sometimes you might have to cause some suffering to solve some suffering so i i am coming to a consequentialist point of view here so uh, let's say that uh, just for an example let's say that you are a deontologist right you are keeping one rule okay uh, in your deontological uh, uh, thing you are uh, making one rule killing is bad right so you see a dictator who's uh, committing a lot of uh, uh, holocausts and stuff so the thing is that what do you do in that situation you have to kill him 
to stop him to prevent more killings so only <laughs> only way you can solve shit in life is by being a consequentialist mm-hmm. right so it's it's not so black and white you you cannot yeah. see you even even if you see black rights wars riots these things we had to do to finally achieve rights we had to do uh, we had to commit coups we have to commit a lot of crimes mm-hmm. but those crimes despite them being a bad event mm-hmm. right that they were some things that have to be done for the greater good right for got you 100 this is mathematical 100 is a greater number than 1 mm-hmm. right so if you take it in scale of existence <laughs> life might even go up to infinity mm-hmm. right so that is uh, the infinity is obviously a greater so so we don't know for sure like when we are going to so the the number is indefinite right so that number is really greater like even if you take 10 years uh, uh even if you cause a, let's say that you get a red button right and if you cause uh, extinction 10 years later if you choose to press it 10 years later that means that it will continue for that 10 years there will be greater suffering mm-hmm. that is the thing yeah 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 i i uh, i see your so, i see the relevance of the trolley analysis here and i i i like i like your <clears throat> argument that um either way we're violating consent you know by bringing a being into existence or by pressing the red button there's a violation of consent there or acting without knowledge of consent but yeah i i i i appreciate your point that the question then becomes which which involves more violation of consent uh, that's one of the things we we would consider and uh yeah we could we could say pressing the red button is more like running as, over pers- one person more, rather than more violation of consent more violation of consent is the thing i talked about um if you yeah, if you bring saying, a sentient yeah. being into existence they obviously don't want to die but they are going to die and in between their lives their consent will be violated by uh, a lot of things right they don't want to suffer so whenever they suffer even even a tiny bit their consent is violated and this happens in this con- consent violation even if you take consent violation not suffering consent violation as a primary thing then as well extinctionism is the only solution because generation after generation suffering after suffering death after death it's going to be violated birth after birth it's going to keep on getting violated whereas extinctionism ends in one thing because you are you are dragging us being from non existence and you are violating its consent. here you are ending the violation of consent once and for all yeah yeah i mean it, it of course raises the question of what the status of future uh beings is um and I, i i take it you would say they don't really have any status you know if they don't exist yet we don't need to take their interests into consideration i i'm somewhat sympathetic with that view but i i'm not sure what to think about the status of future beings and i'm I'll open to the idea just uh, just just to say let me finish just let me make my point here so when you if you push a genuinely totalizing red button like let's say it's the ultimate red button which would never allow any kind of life anywhere in reality to come into existence again not just local earth red button in some sense which i can't eliminate uh, it seems um you are preventing all future beings from ever coming into existence right and though we can't pin the violation of those rights on a particular existers um there is a sense in which you've now just taken out of the basket of options for reality any kind of life ever coming into existence and so the uh, question if if that's so if 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 the, the if the future beings interest should have some weight in 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 the question of whether to push the red button or not the question then just the empirical psychological question then just persists of what is what is the value of life you know um do, do you see yourself contradicting here you are you are worried about the desires of future beings okay 
you are speaking as if future beings exist and want to come into existence in the future as i exactly. said before like do you do you say that okay can i say that uh, if if uh, you know uh, um by by uh, my parents right by refusing to have more than one child they have deprived the rest of the future children of uh, you know life or uh, they have ended their whole generation whole reality is it a right argument if i keep this argument then ethically everybody should reproduce up till infinity up they up to up until their reproductive organs fail you know <laughs> uh, become unhealthy because this, this yeah. is not a good argument at all because nobody i am not crying over my sister who is uh, experiencing some suffering because i don't have a sister and i am i don't even think twice if i go to uh, you know a party or a festival do you keep thinking like you know if i had 10 brothers and sister 10 sisters they would have enjoyed this carnival no right that would be absurd no but if if we're utilitarian um then we're we're just we're interested there's a, you know kind of long termism is implied by utilitarianism i think and so we're interested in maximizing you know total value of experiences and so a utilitarian should ask you know before they push that red button what experiences are they preventing from happening here and in this I am not to totalizing in that totalizing red button um you're preventing some you know some asymptotic approach of infinity of uh, experience for thinking across the whole multiverse or whatever i mean for the vast practically infinite future of reality we're just wiping out the possibility of any kind of sentience coming into existence and so, so uh, I, yeah i i wouldn't talk in terms of violating the rights of these possible future beings but as a ut thinking from a utilitarian perspective by the way i i'm not a diet in the wool utilitarian myself either but but thinking from a utilitarian angle, which is a useful way to think about these things, at least partly. I, I don't want to think from an utilitarian angle because negative utilitarianism, as we we have made clear through many examples uh, before in our uh, conversation, it is a fact. See, th this is not some uh, you know debatable stuff we are talking about. No, no positive thing can justify things like starvation, uh, rape, uh, uh, you know, cancer, these kinds of intense suffering that exist out there. So negative utilitarianism is an absolute fact. So why would I want to think from a utilitarian angle? I, I don't want to think from a utilitarian angle. For me, preventing, uh, not, not for me, factually, for logically, preventing these uh, kinds of intense suffering uh, is the absolute thing to do because none of the other things seem to justify these things. Yeah. So I'm doing is the it, facts. Is it, is it a deontological kind of position then? This is this is the um, primary rule. It's not a deontologist. Of... I, 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 as I already told you, I'm absolute consequentialist. Oh, it's consequential. Sorry. Okay. Got you. It's consequentialist and you're not utilitarian because of the way you wait positive and negative experiences, which is different from a typical utilitarian. I got you. It's just, it's so it's consequentialist, but where negative experiences receive a um, trumping kind of weight. Uh, got you. Um, I, yeah, I guess I'm just not sure, again, empirically, psychologically, what to say about the relative value of these horrific things, whether life might be worth living in spite of them, you know, or with, with them too. I'm, I'm open to that possibility. And I just think a lot of people who like part of, you know, a lot of people do live and at the end of it say, even with these horrible things and they've undergone some of them um, and maybe they're undergone. As I, as I mentioned just, just in one of my first just a, just examples. A just a sec. Let me, let me finish. You know, they, they wait the evidence and they say it's still worth it. You know, at least in my, in my case, they might say that at the end of a, life full of positive and negative experiences and i can't i just i don't feel comfortable completely dismissing that kind of judgment by reducing it to you know transposed will to survive i think that is a factor psychologically but i think 
someone could also wisely and reasonably assess life in a way which is different from the way you are weighting it. Again, just another reason to make me hesitate before I push that red red button. Again, if anybody decides that life should continue, and uh, you know uh, this these things that I mentioned, starvation, these things should continue. They they might be an optimist. They might be having a utilitarian perspective. They might be having any other you know, deontology, whatever crap there is. Uh, I would say that. I mean, obviously, they they are the ones with the red button, and they are the ones who are deciding not pre to press it or not to press it. So if they don't press it, then it's unethical. It's as simple as that. So whatever perspective you might have, you might be, uh, your brain might be different than mine, uh, you know, uh, but the thing is that when it comes to taking a decision for uh, millions of sentient beings, you have to depend on logic rather than your wants, needs or biases. In that case, if you prioritize, uh, because uh, uh, you said motherly love, anything. If, if you prioritize that over, uh, you know, rapes and uh, starvation and etc, etc, then you are being unethical. It's as simple as that. Very simple. This is, a, this is not something uh, that is, you know, psychological. It's rather a fact that no positive thing in this world can justify uh, some of the intense sufferings that I have mentioned. Because I, I can really mention you some kinds of cruel sufferings that are very common. I mentioned about the dark web. You can just browse through some sadistic yeah. uh, animal yeah. torture videos there. No, I, I hear so, you. Yeah. Uh, none of the, none of the, even if one, one sentient being among hundred sentient being, uh, you mentioned some ratios and all that. Even one sentient being had to go through that kind of torture for let uh, rest of the. Uh, sentient beings to continue existence, uh, a privileged ex existence, it is still not justified to con continue existence. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, you're calling, it, you're, you're calling it a moral fact. I, it might be. You might be right about that. Um, I, I I would say it's at least for you a kind of axiom. You know, it's like... It's, it is it's a not, fact. It, until, until you disprove me, uh, see, this is a fact. Okay. I, I can tell you one thing that is a fact. Um, all bad is suffering. All bad uh, things, all bad things are suffering. Uh -huh. You cannot name a single thing in this world that is mm -hmm. bad that doesn't have any suffering involved, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a fact. So until you name me one thing that is bad that doesn't involve any suffering or potential suffering, this fact cannot be disproven. Mm -hmm. Same way. Mm -hmm. Uh, until and unless you can name me one thing that can justify rape or starvation or the intense suffering that I mentioned, mm -hmm. right? That can justify it. That will remain a fact that nothing can justify these things. Okay. So it may be or may not be. It's not the case. You you name me one thing. Okay. Well. Yeah. Um... Maybe I'll let you have the last word there. Um, and, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're. Uh, uh, I think we have. You have a strong intuition about that, and as I said, you might be right, but I'm just not. not Again, sure. it's not an intuition. If you had to break facts, you have to give me something, some reasoning, some example, something that can break that fact. So if you, if you have to uh, disprove, uh, you know, uh, something mm -hmm. like uh, Einstein's relativity. You have to give something that is against some evidence. You have to pro produce a scientific evidence. You have to produce a factual evidence against it. So these facts, well, I, I can I, I, until you disprove them, this will remain a fact. Well, I, I think you you're assuming you're, you're assuming the burden of proof is on the other side here, and that's obviously that's the burden of which... proof. Obviously, the burden of proof is on the other side because I am making a claim that. Okay, nothing can justify these things. So you have to, because uh, you have to prove me one thing, because there, there are millions of things in this world, right? So I, I am saying none of them justify these sufferings. None of them. So you prove me in, the, in those millions of things, you prove me one positive thing that can justify, uh, you, you take and disprove me.
you take that example and disprove it. No, you're right. That, you that, disprove you're, facts. you're right. That would be the way to disprove your claim. But my que- yeah. my point about burden of proof is just that, I mean, I, I, one could say, no, the burden of proof is on you to show with mathematical certainty that your axiom is correct. I have already given you mathematical certainty. I have already named you. See, whatever pleasures are there in this world, okay, uh, you can name anything. I have I've given you the freedom also, right? So I, I uh, if I start naming, probably four hours won't be enough. I don't have to name it also. So I have, I have kept that claim. It may be anime, it may be sex, it may be love, it may be anything. It cannot justify the intense suffering that I have described. So if if you have uh, another uh, thing that I have not considered, then you can give me, right? Otherwise, you accept that it's a fact. You don't know well, you're anything not, you're that, not, is, that can justify not, this. But you're not just making the empirical claim that the bad things outweigh, you know, in a standard utilitarian way, the good things you're making a claim that the bad things should trump you know the, the good things that bad things have a special weight that's why you're not a utilitarian and again you might be right about that i just i just i'm not totally convinced by that claim um and you again, can think about then, it just it's just a sec then there's the meta question of where the burden of proof here is your principle is plausible you know and and the examples you give are horrifying and vivid and uh, compelling but we're talking about the philosophical, uh, axiological claim about how to weight suffering. That's something that needs maybe argument, and I'm not. I'm not sure the burden of proof is on someone who wants to disprove that. It might be, but there's there's so there's the empirical question of how to how these things actually compare in in life, and then there's the uh, meta meta question of how where the burden of proof lies in regards to this principle. But I see your principle, and I feel. It's quite compelling, and uh, you know I'm happy to end it end it there. Obviously, um, you're quite confident about some of these things, and I am sympathetic with some of your perspective for sure. I'm just maybe not quite as confident about it, and that's why I would probably hesitate a lot more than you before I'd push yeah. that before cool. I push that button. But I feel the I feel the I feel the pull of that button for sure. And um, yeah, it's been really uh, really good to talk to you, Steve. Um, um, yeah. it's nice, nice to talk to someone who's, who's got that background in animal welfare and compassion and, uh, activism, but has maybe a, a perspective a little bit different from what you might typically find at, uh, you know, on a Facebook vegan page or, or, or whatever. So it was really, really valuable, uh, to talk to someone who's got that different perspective and is also philosophically articulate and informed. So, um, I hope this conversation was was good for you too, and yeah, uh, sure. we're never going to wrap it all up and resolve it all. You know, this is life; it's full of strife, including dialogic strife. So it never never resolves until until that red button is pushed. So, uh, but uh, I, I wish you the best, and um, maybe maybe I'll stop recording now, and then we can uh, just wrap it up. Yeah. yeah.